Aloha everyone and thank you for joining our COVID-19 Public Health Action Webinar, Climate Justice, Vulnerability and Resilience to COVID-19. My name is Steph Moyer and I'm the Community Initiatives and Training Coordinator for the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Before we get started, there's some Zoom housekeeping we'd like to go over. For all questions, please utilize the chat box or Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We are not offering any continuing education credits for our COVID webinar series. And lastly, all webinars are recorded and will be available on the Hawaii Public Health Training Hui's YouTube channel. Without further ado, I am honored to introduce you to our presenters for today. Our first presenter is Lauren Ballesteros Watanabe. Lauren is third generation working class Mexican American from East Los Angeles. She is an alumni of the University of Hawaii at Manoa with organizing experience in economic justice and identity empowerment through the arts. She is also a producer and editor for Root Cause Remedies, a grassroots podcast highlighting the connection between Aloha Aina and environmental justice through revolutionary storytelling. Our second presenter today is Dr. Alan Friedlander. Over the past 35 years, Dr. Alan Friedlander has spent more than 10,000 hours underwater, from coral reefs to the poles and to the depths of thousands of meters. He is chief scientist for the National Geographic Society's Pristine Seas Program and a researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Over the past decade, Alan has led expeditions to some of the last wild places in the ocean, resulting in the creation of 23 large marine protected areas encompassing more than 6.5 million square kilometers. Alan received his PhD from the University of Hawaii and was a National Research Council postdoctoral associate with NOAA in Monterey, California. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Lauren. Um, thank you so much. I'll start sharing my screen. Hello, everyone. I am here. Yes, so thank you for that introduction. I'm very grateful to be in this space with you all. Again, I'm Lauren Baisos Watanabe. I'm the organizer and really excited to share with you our, our work. Sierra Club is um, historically known for taking on a variety of different issues and whether it be conservation, water rights, um, but with the climate crisis and the urgent need to switch off of fossil fuels, um, energy justice and ensuring um, that our transition has justice and equity at the center are really important. So um, because energy justice is defined in a variety of ways, I just wanted to um, set context with how it is rooted um, similar to environmental justice and climate justice, which say that every person has a right to clean air, clean water, and no one should be disproportionately burdened um, by climate change. And so here locally, um, really taking a look at our energy system, which is currently fossil fuel reliant, it's profit driven, and we would like to change that, use this opportunity in the transition to um, transform our system to be based in clean, renewable energy that works for the public interests, including the health and well being of the community and the environment, which we currently don't necessarily have. So, from that, um, why this is so important, and um, you know, with with COVID, how it has really exposed um, our vulnerability to um, major natural disasters, and we are seeing more oncoming um, hurricanes and threats and flooding that already happened. So climate change is here. So um, why this is important is because this critical and urgent need, again, to switch off of fossil fuels, we want to make sure that it is done in a just way because we've seen now in dirty and in clean energy projects that there has been um, disproportionate impacts on low income and working class communities and that Men, the mentality of extraction or um, quote unquote sacrifice zones that cannot be a part of our transition. Um, so we have to be intentional about that. So um, in snapshot as best I can do, our energy system um, is very unjust. And just starting from you know, the top of, it is owned by a corporation and um, something really 
to understand is that this is an investor owned utility model and there are different types of models. And so what we have and have had for a really long time is um, this massive institution, Hawaiian Electric Industries. Um, I'm located on Oahu, so we use um, HECO a lot, but they have subsidiaries on Hawaii Island. So that's like Helco and Maui Miko, if you come across that. Um, and really important to know is that because this is a investor owned model, um, currently the we feel they are beholden more to their shareholders than they are actually to um, the needs of its customers and the broader well-being of our environment. And what's really also very telling is like some of these equity firms, um, a part of Hawaiian Electric are the largest in the world, with like billions of dollars in global assets. Um, they're in the industry of electric generation, but they're really in the business of making money. And um, Hawaii is more of a portfolio piece. That's where the top decision making is, right? It's really disconnected um, from the impact and consequence of those decisions. And so really like um, rooting ourselves in this understanding how old this institution is. It was incorporated in 1891 and is really one of the most influential businesses in Hawaii and um, is deeply intertwined in our economic, political, and social landscapes. And so um, I'm going to, again, be another snapshot of this, this history of how it started in an injustice. Um, so William Hall, who was the first president and CEO of Hawaiian Electric, um, had a key role in the overthrow. And so so just two um, examples of that. So Hawaii actually had electricity generation than a, a lot of the world and definitely um, than the continental US. And that's the attribution of King Kalakaua who was really innovative and wanted to bring um, electricity to the islands. And he did that successfully. And this is during you know another time of where we're seeing more foreign investment coming into um, Hawaii and seeing really electricity generation as a new business opportunity. So William Hall was one of the players in the Bayonet Rebellion, which was um, a small set of militiamen who forced, you know, at 2 a.m. Um, at gunpoint for King Kalakaua to sign a new constitution, which stripped a lot of the powers of the monarchy and really switched the power dynamics with um, taking away Native Hawaiian voting rights and tying it more to foreigner um, land ownership, wealthy land ownership. And so that's one instance. And then the other, which is really important, is just looking at the overthrow itself. So five days before the overthrow, King um, Lilo Kalani planned to sell their electricity generation to a, a private company, 10-year franchise. Um, there was regulations within that. So three days after that, she also instituted, um, declared a new constitutions, which would restore a lot of those powers back to the monarchy, um, as well as, again, this um, yeah, switching the, the power dynamics back. So the response was um, two days after that was the overthrow, which happened. And basically, William Hall, again, who was uh, part of the National Guard at that, he actually um, instilled, ensured that martial law was still intact. So when the time came to bid for this utility 10 year franchise, um, no one else bid. Hawaiian Electric was the only one. And ever since then, it, we've been dealing with Hawaiian Electric. And I think the, the point there is really like, this was more about you know economics and power than it ever was about bringing electricity to the islands like the monarchy had. So here we are with one of the most expensive um, energy systems in the nation. And a lot of that's because it's imported fossil fuels and imported coal. And I've already shared a bit about, um, you know, the targeted siting and what we're seeing with environmental racism within our, our system. So the COVID impact, um, you know, which really brought an opportunity of showing how one expensive it is, um, doesn't have to be that way. But the way it operates currently is that Hawaiian Electric is able to pass down its cost to its customers, right? If oil prices go up, or down, it gets passed on. Um, so it's been so expensive. And with COVID, um, people are struggling in a variety of ways. And we've been, um, you know, calling on the utility, which is not hurting, is still making record profits to do the right thing by their customers and actually offer 
feel forgiveness because here we are um, over a year later and not everybody has um, you know a stable job back and there's still people who are extremely struggling for this and we can keep extending the utility moratorium it's great that that is happening but that doesn't mean that it's not um, still bills just piling up and we think the right thing to do the just thing to do is to offer um, bill forgiveness to those who are most impacted and, and in need and so um, I have that bitly there for you guys if you actually want to um, I can please you, you can sign our petition and you can actually email the CEO of Hawaiian Electric um, making the same call for bill forgiveness. So um, as I said, environmental racism in our um, energy system, you know, what you do to the land, you do to the people and what we're seeing in this extractive um, top down approach to energy and disconnect is uh, we have a coal plant which is located in Kapolei and if you know, just anything about uh, energy resources, coal is one of the dirtiest um, forms of energy, it has incredible amounts of toxins. I mean, it's really unfortunate that the um, Environmental Protection Agency, the federal government doesn't label it as being such a toxic material. But what you're seeing there is a picture of um, a mountain of ash because when you burn coal it makes two types of byproducts fly ash so all of those toxins are going into the air and you know workers are breathing that in and then what has been happening is to use that byproduct they have been um, trucking it to Nanakuli in Waianae and that is um, Hawaiian working class community that is way too close to a landfill that every single day they are putting this really toxic material there and landfills themselves already have toxins that leach into the groundwater, I mean ground and water. And so this accumulation of toxins has really created a public health crisis in um, Nanakuli. And it's really, you know, even though we have a, a coal ban, the coal plant is set to close by 2023, that was mandated by the state. Um, this is still happening every single day. And again, thinking about how vulnerable these communities are, right? They have high rates of asthma. Nanakuli actually has a lower life expectancy. The US Census Bureau um, found it to be about 10 years less than the rest of the island. And it's this accumulation of toxins, um, again, making communities more vulnerable to respiratory diseases. And I think that is incredibly important and this shouldn't be happening, but it is until the coal plant is obsolete. Um, that is the AES coal plant why I mentioned um, the Kahuku William Farm because just because it's clean or renewable does not make it perfect, a perfect energy source. And so it is really important, you know, AES coal plant, AES is a global um, uh, inst institution, can't think of the other word. And so AES is actually a part of this Kahuku wind farm, right? We're really just seeing like the switch into um, clean energy. That's why they're, they're um, interested in these projects. And so this wind farm has been too close and um, to communities, to residents than is usually typically allowed. And there is data out there showing about noise pollution. And with hurricanes being more of an oncoming threat, those blades, there can be blade throw and it creates an extreme hazard for communities. And so again, we have to be critical and understanding um, of how we are making this transition and not unfairly burdening the same types of communities. Again, we're all working class communities. And there are um, definitely, like, there are Supreme Court case hearings, again, um, how this has been done, ignoring the opeopea, which are cultural sacred bats. Uh, it's culturally important, but also important equally. So we have to again be um, understanding and critical of how we do this. And so what we are also seeing is that the current scale of utility projects, right, these really large scales, those are some of the biggest turbines in the nation. Um, they have co consequences to our, how we use our ag land, um, environmental issues like stream diversion and land loss. So really important again to be critical of what the transition looks like. So I'll just take a um, quick moment to this, you know, clean versus renewable definitions. I, you know, broke them down to the bare bones, um, how to distinguish, because they are not the same. So clean is from zero or minimal emissions, um, sources like solar, hydro, and wind power. And we say minimal because in construction and transportation, there are some emissions, but it's definitely not the same as coal. And with renewable, um, we are seeing, you know, this 
very broad definition of what is considered um, naturally replenishing and flow, flow limited is problematic and um, allowing for there to be these broad uh, definitions, it can make big implications of um, what we are actually using as and quote, quote unquote as renewable. So an example of that um, is our waste to energy system. This is you know for the county of Honolulu. So currently Hawaiian Electric um, contracts the city and county of Honolulu's H power facility and to burn trash for power. Uh, burning trash, trash incineration is really a, a, like there are so many, um, you know, especially with you know, plastic, so many toxins in these materials that are going into the air and it's uh, hard to quantify because it's, it's all these air pot, pot, particles. And so that's one issue. It actually has, um, it emits greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, not the best type of um, solution. And yeah, so it, and then waste energy, just thinking of the entirety of the, the products that go into it. And this is an economic burden. So when, um, because of this contract, right, the city has to produce a certain amount of energy from this facility, the city then has to send a certain amount of trash that will actually produce that adequate amount. It's something like 800,000 tons um, per year. And if not, if we don't meet the quota, we are fined. And I say we, because we're taxpayers and this is city monies. And if we go under or over, the city gets fined. It's this really like fine line of where it should be. Um, really doesn't make sense, especially when you know realize that um, we need to source reduce, not create more trash. And with COVID, it provided a little bit of an opportunity to, you know, highlight this um, not correct kind of deal. Like, I don't know how this um, came to be, right? But if we have less tourists, we saw less trash, and that's a good thing, right? Because then we're seeing less trash into our waste streams, into, um, into the ocean, Everyone knows they ever done a beach cleanup. It's a really huge problem. So the city council is actually looking at, can we find a way to get out of this deal? Because it's it's not making sense and we don't wanna be reliant on trash for energy. So that's one example. Um, and so my work and what we're trying to do and what I'm you know speaking with you guys about is like highlighting these injustices and really trying to think of a better um, system and a better approach and um, I'll share two examples, but one of them is um, really my organizing, really just trying to build out a network of community leaders, um, people who've been directly impacted, whether it's dirty or clean energy system, and really start shifting the paradigm of how we, um, the larger we as like community, can work together to think of locally sourced, um, community driven energy and energy projects that are not beholden to um, a utility that is beholden to shareholders, um, but is really rooted in the people and so we're trying to be solution oriented and how can we again take the power back uh, the other way we're trying to um, build this out or I am is actually a monthly meeting with students um, whether high school college university so that can be broad definitions we've had a variety of age groups so it's a little intergenerational sometimes but really this was about um, us trying to un unpack how our system works like I'm sure I shared a, a load of information with you all um, and we're really trying to take this really huge topic really high level talk, topic and break it down so that the everyday person can understand how it works and how we can advocate for something better because at the end of the day our energy system impacts each and every one of us we're using it right now <laughs> um, in this very virtual COVID world and so we're seeing um, how important it is to do this to ensure that our energy system again is just and equitable and think solution oriented so um, if you are a student I welcome you to join us the last Thursdays we have speakers we do a little bit of um, educational content and then we um, are in breakout groups to really build out like um, interactive peer-to-peer um, -peer solution oriented um, frameworks so that was me <laughs> and what I had. So I will, I can also, I guess you guys will get a mailer maybe to um, see those, but please follow us again. Um, Root Cause Remedies was mentioned. We're talking about energy justice this season and then on Instagram and Facebook, you can get more info.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing how our energy system has a big impact on our pollution in our state. And now I'm excited to turn it over to Dr. Freelander to talk about the impacts of pollution on our marine life and any changes that were observed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Great. Um, thanks very much for that. It was great to hear what Lauren had to say. So I'm going to talk, um, switch gears a little bit here and talk about um, the CHI and why the marine environment is important to all of us, how it's important for public health, and what were some of the implications of, of COVID on, on the marine environment. So, um, so why should we care about the ocean? Um, it produces half the oxygen we breathe. So try holding your breath half the time. It's, it's not going to be pleasant. Um, it's also the largest carbon sink in the world. So it's really important for, for climate mitigation. It provides protein for over half the planet, a, an accessible, fairly inexpensive protein source for a lot of people. It provides livelihoods for hundreds of millions of people around the world, particularly in developing countries. So it's really important for subsistence and, and for commerce. It's the treasure trove of biodiversity on the planet. Twice as many phyla exist in the ocean than exist on land, and 12 phyla are exclusively marine. So marine biodiversity is really important and unique. Tourism is one of the fastest growing sectors in the global economy, and marine tourism is a very important part of that. We all know that in Hawaii because um, tourism is the economic engine for the state for better or worse, and marine tourism is a big component of that. It also connects people to place and to culture. We know that in Hawaii, this hukilau here in Waimanalo from the early 1900s. Uh, Hawaii, Pacific Islanders, people who live in islands are pretty much not only for the individual, but for the community at large. Um, and recreation, um, whether you're fishing oleo in Kaneohe Bay or surfing or paddling or swimming, a healthy ocean is important for individual health and also mental health. Um, a lot of people would have had a hard time surviving COVID over the last year if we wouldn't been able to get in the ocean. Um, I myself have spent almost every day in the water since COVID, so I know how important it is. And finally, shoreline protection. Um, you know, this is protecting our shorelines from waves, makes great surfing waves. But as a whole, you know, the, all these things are important because without healthy oceans, we just don't have a healthy society. Um, and in Hawaii, it's really important. Uh, the nearshore fisheries provide over 7 million meals a year to Hawaii, mainly Hawaii residents. And, and the, the non-commercial catch is much more important than the commercial catch. The, well, not much more, but the non-commercial catch is three times higher than the commercial catch and takes a, a much greater diversity of species. So these are people like subsistence fishers, recreational fishers, um, people fishing for customary practices. So it's really important. And, and the dollar value is large too. The, the commercial fishery sector near shore is only $3 million a year. It's not insignificant, but the non-commercial sector is seven to 12 million. So three to four times higher than that. Um, so there's a lot of um, you know, value both monetarily and non-monetarily from the nearshore fisheries in Hawaii. So despite the importance of oceans on, on a global scale, we can see that the human footprint in the ocean is, is enormous. The, the red areas are the hot spots. So all of Europe, Southeast Asia, Philippines, Indonesia, India, these places are all heavily impacted, but most places in the ocean have been impacted by some shape or form uh, by people. And, and Hawaii is no exception here. Um, we've got data going back over 100 years in Hawaii, and you can see for many of the prime important resource species like Olua, Oeo, Moi, Aveoveo, Nenui, they have all declined in both their catch, the, the black dots, and the catch rates, the dotted lines there, by over 90% in the last 100 years. So we've seen a huge decline in commercial fisheries in Hawaii um, over that time. 
And uh, to this day, we see a huge difference in the health of our coral reefs and coral reef fisheries around the state. This is probably one of the most extensive studies that ever been done. We had like 20,000 surveys from around the archipelago, um, made the front page of the advertiser a couple of years ago, which was uh, a, nice, a nice thing. But if you look at that graph on the bottom there, so we used MOKU, which is the traditional Hawaiian boundaries um, or districts are nested within MOKU. And MOKUs represent different areas, um, windward, leeward, north shore, south shore, wet, dry. And so they were the traditional management units that were used. And so we looked at MOKU using a lot of visual survey data. And what we see is the orange bars and then the orange MOKU are the places with the lowest fish biomass. So the lowest amount of fish in the state. And we can see most of that is around Oahu and South and West Maui. So that's the bad news. The good news is there's really healthy parts of the state left, North Shore Molokai, Hamakua Coast, down to Lave, Niihau, and the whole coast of, um, of Kauai. So there, um, it's a mixed bag here, places that there's lots of people, the resources have been heavily impacted, places that are remote and away from people are, are still in pretty good shape. So there's multiple solutions to this problem, um, sustainable fisheries, managed areas, restoration, uh, community managed areas, but I'm, I'm going to focus more on this one at the top, marine protected areas or M MPAs, because they're a fairly simple solution. But to, before I get to that, I want to talk about traditional management practices in Hawaii. And so um, Hawaii manage the resource. Uh, the resource, you know, is very scale dependent. So local people have the most to say and most to gain and most to lose from management. But also things like closed areas, closed season, uh, not harvesting fish before they have the chance to spawn, not harvesting, you know, limiting for some special species and limiting access. That existed a long time ago in Hawaii. And you know, if you look at the Moku map here on Oahu, you can see the, the major Moku, there's um, six Moku, and then all the Abwa are the nested colored areas inside of each of those Moku. So they, the management strategy was both comprehensive and hierarchical in, in ancient Hawaii and elsewhere in the Pacific. So getting more towards contemporary marine protected areas. Marine protected areas are areas where you don't fish. And what happens in there is you get more fish and those fish are bigger. And what they do is they spill out into the adjacent areas, so they improve fisheries, but also these fish are much larger than the fish in, outside the protected areas, and they just produce a lot more keiki. So they also help to replenish the outside areas by egg production. So these are the best tools that we have to conserve biodiversity, but also to, to enhance fisheries. Um, and data that we've uh, have and we've seen over time is that areas that are highly protected, these would be the areas like, like Hanama Bay or Pupukea, Kealakakua Bay, Molokini, the resource fish biomass within those is, is much higher than it is in open areas. But also the point is some of these areas that are poorly protected and don't have good habitat are not much better than, than areas that are open to fishing. So highly protected areas are highly effective at conserving fish and, and supporting fisheries, but areas that allow a lot of fishing to take place within their borders are not as effective. So getting on to what happened during COVID, um, I'm gonna give a couple examples here. So Hanama Bay Reserve, um, most people may be familiar with, it was favored fishing grounds by the Ali in ancient Hawaii. It was the first established marine protected area in Hawaii in 1967. It gets over a million people a year and generates over $35 million in income. So it's an important economic generator, but it's also, um, you know, it's got its costs. So this is what Hanama Bay looks like on a typical day with lots of people in the water, both near shore and just everywhere on the beach. And this is what Hanama Bay looked like during COVID. There weren't people coming to Hanama Bay and it gave the fish 
and all the other animals a chance to rest. Um, I was fortunate enough to get, I get to go in Hanama Bay on Tuesdays when it's closed and it looks much different. You see a weo, you see all kinds of fish in that really shallow water where there's people who are all laying on the beach and swimming around. And so it disturbs the natural processes. Those animals come back um, once you stop people from going there. So even though these areas are important, we need to think about the carrying capacity for these areas. You know, is a million people a year too many for a small place like Hanama Bay? And COVID has really given us an opportunity to reassess, you know, how much non-consumptive use is too much. Um, yeah, the water quality increased and a lot of schools of Manini and lots of schools of fish have just come back um, in droves. Molokini is another place we've been working, um, also a heavily visited marine protected area, over 300,000 people a year, $20 million a year in revenue. It's a really small place and it can get packed full of boats pretty easily. This is what Molokini has looked like when people weren't there. I got the chance to go in April during the pandemic and there was no tour boats there. A lot of fish had been coming in. We have been doing some long-term work in Molokini looking at movement patterns of species like um, uh, Oio and, I'm um, not sorry, uh, Omilu and Alua and sharks. And when you get a critical mass of boats in there, those animals get displaced from, from the crater. So again, um, you know, managing the amount of use is important if we want these systems to maintain to be healthy. Um, so we got a chance to go there, we looked at it, and big schools of striped alua came in. We saw a lot of dolphins, manta rays. And so um, without all those people there, animals really start to take the place back over again. So the ecosystems are resilient if, if given the chance. Um, and then Pukakea, another place on the island of Oahu where we've been working for the last couple decades. Um, this nearshore habitat or, or Puahonua is an important nursery habitat for a lot of species. The keiki for a lot of important food fish hang out in these areas, but you can see on that top panel there that when it's just choked full of people, it's not the best place to be if you're a juvenile fish. And so a lot of these animals get displaced. We need to consider what's the right level of, of human use that is appropriate for these protected areas. Um, and we wouldn't have had this, this in the absence of, of COVID. So it's kind of been an opportunity to reassess how we engage with the environment. Um, so what can we do at the state, county, and community level? It's kind of five take-homes, I think, for me. Um, Community-based managed areas have been very effective on some of the neighbor islands in Molokai, um, Haena on the North Shore of Kauai have developed community managed areas. And um, when communities are you know, galvanized towards protecting their resources, they can be highly effective. Um, marine protected areas, like I talked about, are effective, but they only account for about 3% of, of state waters. Uh, gear restrictions, we do have some restrictions in place. Um, gill nets have been, uh, lay gill nets have been outlawed in some places, but they're still prevalent in a lot of places. And this gear is very non-selective. You see these little baby hammerhead sharks here, they got, um, they got caught up. They weren't the target species, but in Kaneohe Bay, you see a lot of baby hammerheads, especially in the summer months when the females are pupping. So uh, they're collateral damage. And then enforcement, uh, fishermen complain about this a lot. Um, they're like, why have more regulations if the existing regulations are not being enforced? And I totally agree with that. We just need to redouble our efforts for enforcing those existing regulations. And probably most importantly is, is public education. Um, like in Hanalei, this Hawaii moon calendar here talks about you know, pono practices, how to fish, when to fish, when not to fish. And so that's gonna go a long way to help people um, interact more effectively and more sustainably with, with the ocean environment. And so what can we do as individuals? Um, I think fish pono is an important thing, you know, uh, proper codes of conduct when you're fishing, understanding natural, you know, actual cycling processes, when things spawn, when not to fish is just as important as when to fish. Um, 
don't use destructive practices. Don't take more than you need. You know, share your catch. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of um, practices that can be initiated that are just reinvigorating knowledge from the past. Choose sustainable seafood. There's all kinds of websites that talk about what are proper seafood uh, that's sustainable to eat and purchase and what's not. Reduce your use of plastics and pollutants. Everything ends up in the ocean in Hawaii eventually. So, you know, be careful. COVID's been a mixed bag, right? Fewer tourists, but everything seems to be packaged now for safety reasons. So, um, you know, reducing that is important. Shop smart, every dollar is the vote, right? So your choices really affect everything, including the ocean. And then, you know, drive less, use less water. Support organizations that you think are good causes for protecting the ocean. And then basically educate yourself and others about Pono practices and how to interact with the ocean, but why we need a healthy ocean to survive and thrive, particularly in Hawaii. Um, and I think that will do it. Thank you so much, Dr. Friedlander. So as a reminder to those on the webinar, uh, feel free to drop your questions that you might have for our presenters into the chat box or the Q&A box as we move into the Q&A uh, portion of today's webinar. So first question is uh, for Lauren. So you mentioned that at both Facebook, um, can you give a little bit more details on that, please? Oh yeah, so um, it's just, Facebook and then the it's for Sierra Club High Sierra Club Hawaii is um, all I meant because we update that and we're on Instagram too Sierra Club High want to follow us perfect thank you so um, Dr Friedlander there has been a recent article by KHON on mask and PPE related pollution are you seeing that type of pollution here on our islands. Yeah, unfortunately, um, between that and all the packaging that we've gone into now to be more COVID safe um, has just created a, a fairly big, big waste stream. Um, yeah, I see. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I end up seeing masks uh, all the time in the shoreline that, that wash up that have been in the ocean. OK, thank you. Um, so next question is for Lauren. What are some new sources of energy that Hawaii can look into? Well, I think really capitalizing on the, the sun we have here, I think that has been like, um, you know, one of the ideal sources, especially with rooftop, rooftop solar or a different scale of um, solar is definitely um, a viable option. I think when we talk about, you know, the landscapes are different on neighbor islands. So Hawaii Island or who cannot right use, I think if we just think more of like the scale of hydropower or um, maybe wind power or small scale solar farms, um, but solar tends to be like, I think the most um, readily viable for us. Thank you. So keeping our oceans um, clean can definitely impact or, or our oceans can definitely impact human health. So what are your thoughts on how we can protect our reefs on top of our marine life? So I guess, I guess the reef uh, in particular is what the question is referring to. So corals, uh, which are under a lot of stress now because climate change is making the oceans warmer. Uh, corals have a sweet spot for temperature that they like. So too hot is bad. They, um, people have heard about coral bleaching where they turn white. They basically, their little microalgae that lives inside them that gives them the color, it bails when it gets too warm. So they expel that. They can reacquire it, but if it gets too hot for too long and you don't have herbivorous fish around like kala and you know other surgeons and, and parrotfish, uhu, um, you can't keep the reef clean. So without the reef, you're not going to have a healthy reef ecosystem. Uh, all kinds of things impact it, right? Shoreline development, um, poor land use practices. So um, Malkata Makai is a really important thing. There's no place in Hawaii that's really out of the coastal zone. So everything we do 
Malka affects what happens in the ocean. Um, so again, if, you know, if you don't have a clean house, you're not gonna have healthy residents. Thank you. So Lauren, what are some big things that the Sierra Club is doing to support environmental health? Um, well, so just to give you a little landscape, um, each of our um, major islands, so on Kauai, um, Hawaii Island and Maui has their own executive groups or volunteer led. And so it looks different on different islands, right? As the, I'm the chapter organizer. And so um, I know one thing is um, Maui and injection wells and, and protecting our water streams is a really um, important issue, right? Because we're seeing a lot of um, water diverted and extracted um, from private companies. And so we really want to make sure we hold like the board, uh, the BLNR, the Board of Land and Natural Resources accountable to ensuring the ecology is protected in these um, leasings of land. So that's one example. Um, I think in general, we are very well known for advocacy at the le legislature, right? Hence like the, the coal ban bill, which took several years um, to get this highly toxic material and its, you know, emissions and with climate change, we're, we try to do it on, on that end as well as like the greater um, whole, <laughs> I guess, say, and, and through the legislature. A couple examples. Thank you. And actually, Lauren, this next question is for you as well. So um, has Sierra Club been addressing issues with harmful pesticide use on agriculture lands near residential areas? Um, I know this remains an issue in various parts of our state. Yes, definitely. So, um, so as is the, the Maui example, our Kauai Island group is, um, I mean, that's one of the areas that they, um, is a priority issue for them. So they do work on that, whether advocating at the county level for better restrictions um, or bans at the legislature. We work really closely in partnerships with organizations like um, Hawaii Progressive Action. And, and maybe I can put that link in the chat for you. And that is a, a core of what they do. And so we work in like in our alliance and coalition to support people who are doing that work too. So Dr. Friedlander, could you talk a little bit about how a healthy marine ecosystem affects our food security here? Right, and then I saw another question in the chat later on, so you may want to check that one too. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, like I, I said in the presentation, for the nearshore environment, it provides about 7 million meals a year for Hawaii, which is mainly local Hawaii residents. So. Um, you know, that's not insignificant. And the other thing is it's important culturally, you know, it's important, there's a lot of sharing networks that, that take place for people sharing fish. So it's, it's an important thing. Um, when resources decline, especially like they do around Oahu for the most part um, and parts of Maui, um, that, that, resili that food resilience is not there, right? You know, people can't count on fish as much. Fish is a really healthy alternative to a lot of other resources. So, um, but you know, we you see the trajectories that I showed over a hundred years and what's going on between Oahu, Maui, and and the other islands. And so, there's definitely a discrepancy between um, where there are lots of people and where there are a few fish, right? And so, um, it's it's a tough question to address just because it's it's important. It's everywhere, but. Um, yeah, it's obvious that we need to have healthy reefs if we're going to provide people that important protein source. Can I share something too? <laughs> um, because I think this is another um, important example of how intertwined um, our energy system is with other crate and um, Again, with COVID highlighting the fact we need to have a localized food economy, not be so dependent like we import over 80 foods um, doesn't quite make sense. And what's happening with um, our transition is um, creating a wedge of are we going to use land for food or for solar farms? And that, I think that is an unfair um, position to put and then say in a community, um, right, do we want food or do we want energy? when it's the ownership is on the utility and a lot of that comes from foot dragging to be quite honest um that we've known we needed to transition um since 2014 2015 so i think 
thinking holistically of how our energy system and everything works and um, is really important. And Dr. Friedlander, I'm not sure if this is the question you might have seen, but kind of tagging along with the food security question, it's a clarification. Um, did, I guess clarifying when you mentioned recreational fishing versus commercial fishing, um, did can you, uh, I guess, clarify if you said that recreational fishing is actually larger than commercial fishing? Right, yeah, that was a question that I, I saw in the chat. So. Um, yeah, most people, for, this is for the nearshore environments and not for like offshore for Ahi and Aku and things like that with the, with the larger commercial boats that go hundreds of miles away. Although there's a local day boat fleet for pelagics for um, tuna as well. But anyway, um, for the nearshore fishery, um, it's recreational subsistence uh, non-reporting commercial. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag of a lot of different things it's 10 times higher than the commercial catch as far as how much effort goes in. So, um, you know, a lot of people recreate, right? So if you, if you go out with your buddies, um, you know, fishing for a lua overnight, you know, you're spending a lot of time out there. You may or may not catch a lot, but um, there's a lot of social interaction, important things above that, up and above just catching fish. But, but yeah, um, the abundance of, and, and when you saw the total catch, it's about three to four times higher as, as well. So there's a lot more effort goes in. Those gears tend to be less efficient than commercial gear. But that's the tricky thing is, you know, Hawaii has the highest proportion of people who fish of any place in the U.S. And everybody fishes in Hawaii. So it becomes an important issue. Again, like it's, it's for recreation. It's for food. It's for culture. It's got a lot of importance. It, it checks a lot of boxes, it's important for a lot of people and a lot of different things. You can, and in fact, um, you know, you can be all of those things at one time because you people sell part of their catch. So it makes you a part-time commercial fisherman. They're out there to recreate. They're, you know, getting alcohol for their family. They're providing, you know, fish for friends and things like that. And so it's got, um, you know, it's got a lot of important aspects to it. That's why any efforts to manage fisheries always meets with a lot of resistance. But um, you know, there's people who are pretty akamai about the fact that um, you know resources aren't sustainable and they're not as healthy as they were in the past. And if we don't change, um, you know, we're not going to have the same resources that we had even in the recent past. Maybe a follow up to that, um, a question for you, Dr. Friedlander, is do you feel that eventually permitting will need to be required for non-commercial fishing given the numbers that you've presented? Right, so Hawaii is the only state that doesn't have, uh, only coastal state that doesn't have a non-commercial fishing license. Um, there's a lot of advocates and um, detractors from, from that. Um, you know, it would be free pretty much for local residents. It would mainly just be a registry. Um, there would be a nominal fee. Um, Hawaii, um, so the Department of Land and Natural Resources ranks near the bottom um, nationally, ranks like 47th or 48th in the amount of money that goes towards natural resource management. So I have a lot of friends there and they do a great job with what they have, but Hawaii has the legislature and the budget has just not been serious about Hawaii's natural environment. We've always taken it for granted. Um, hopefully COVID's a bit of a wake up call, but you can't sit near the bottom of the heap in the amount of money that you throw towards resource management and expect the environment to continue to be healthy. Uh, and Seems like we kind might. of segued on the question, but um, anyway, that, that's my Okay, sorry, it cut out at the very end, Dr. Friedlander. So I don't you know, know if you maybe my back? you said. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Yeah, it's just my soapbox that, you know, it's not only it ranks so low per capita, um, you know, money that goes towards natural resource management, but throw 10 million tourists on top of that, it's not even close, right? And so um, there's a real big disconnect between how our natural resources are managed and how, how much we value them. Perfect, thank you. 
Um, so question for Lauren, what are some other states that have diversified their energy sources that could be a model for Hawaii? Well, there's a few. Um, I guess what comes to mind actually is, is California, just because they have a similar investor-owned utility model that um, in the same way has been dragging their feet. Um, um, pg and &E. I think one one major paradigm shift and of how they're diversifying is really scaling down again the utility to local um, source right there's different options whether it's like rooftop solar um, that is shared right if you cannot afford to put rooftop solar there's um, organizations and initiatives in California who are trying to do it like virtually because um, Hoi actually had um, prior net energy metering not to be in like the weeds about it, but was basically allowing for everyday people um, easier access to rooftop solar. And now we've made a transition trying to do community-based renewable energy, which is being done across the US as well as creating cooperatives instead of investor owned um, that we really pull from um, those, those concepts, but really trying to make it work um, to Hawaii's unique land. So I think the, the biggest thing to take from diversifying first is really breaking up the profit driven model because that tends to be like the huge like elephant in the room of like why things aren't working and even the public utilities commission and the state legislature even the governor is really putting pressure on our utility because um, they don't have a clear plan of say how to replace coal um, and so it's maybe justifying well maybe we need to downscale not be centralized and distributive energy which is a growing movement across the u.s so um, California and yeah, Los Angeles has done a good job doing that. So that's the one that came to mind. Perfect, thank you. So um, both of you, and maybe we'll start with Dr. Friedlander, but um, both of you have mentioned the positive environmental impacts due to the decline of tourism that we saw during the pandemic. So what can we do uh, or how do we continue to protect our land and in our resources as we see tourism opening up again? I think COVID was an unprecedented positive opportunity for us just because we wouldn't have been having this discussion otherwise. It was like full steam ahead, right? The tourist authority with the fact that we had 10 million tourists last year, like that was a great thing. Um, on that note, in the mid 1980s, we had about six plus million tourists a year in Hawaii. And the net economic benefit with 4 million more people is zero. So what Hawaii has done is they transitioned from kind of high end, high value tourism to mass market tourism. So we see virtually no net economic benefit from all those additional people. And what we do see is a big negative from all that because it puts all the pressure on the natural resources, on the environment, on our roads, on you know the, the utilities, you name it, right? And so. I think we should take this opportunity to say, wow, you know, okay, so this was a huge economic hardship for people during the last year plus, but is there a way to rethink this so that we either have, you know, we have less, more effective um, and, you know, more efficient tourism and then diversifying our economy as well, because um, otherwise it would have just been, we would have had blinders on and kept going along the same road. So I, I think this is a good opportunity to think about that. What, what the answer is, is we need to put pressure on the legislature and the tourism authority to, you know, rethink the current model. Yeah, I think um, everything you said, doctor, <laughs> and I would just um, add in this, again, paradigm shift because um, our state and, you know, Hawaii Tourism Authority, there's so much funny that goes into tourism that, yes, we're not getting back. And the, the shift is thinking how we're just um, localizing our systems. Um, we need to for climate resilience just as much as we make economic resilience for our islands. And I think um, with the, the energy system, I think it's so important to just um, highlight the fact again, I'm a little bit losing my, my train of thought, but um, that, oh darn, okay, I was there. I just wanted to add like one or two things. I guess is the, the um, there are 
a, a great amount of ingenuity that has come from local nonprofits, and I just want to uplift one of them, Aina Aloha Economic Futures, that is really trying to instill deep governance into our, our um, institution and solutions. I think the solutions really need to come from the people because obviously the tops are not um, working within the public interest, I think. And so that's all I want to add is like, um, I'm really believing in like people power and everyday people, like we can rebuild our systems and not be dependent on our quote unquote elected leaders or or whatnot. So and that if in the energy system as well. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So as we're getting ready to wrap up the webinar, um, just want to open this up to both of you again. Um, where can folks go to find more resources on the topics that you've shared and maybe how we as uh, people working in public health can get involved? Yeah, I can go um, first. Yeah, because, yeah. so um, we often say, um, you know, our, our social media, we try to put out as much information, whether it's like at the legislature, the bills we're following, the work we're doing for people, because it really takes um, everyday people, right, making the demands we need to see. So we do have what's called Capital Watch. Um, the legislature is almost over, but we're trying to grow that into our county level advocacy to get systemic changes for the um, things we see. So um, that is one way as well through our social media and then if again if you're a student our colloquiums specifically if you want interested in energy justice I, and you're more than welcome to come if you're a health student or not i don't know or know of any so right um so there's lots of resources out there i think both local and um and national and, and global so my day job with national geographic is trying to work on the last wild places in the ocean so we um, we're pretty global in nature and we're working both from remote places and places with people. Um, and we're trying to, um, you know, so uh, you go to the Pristine Seas website, there's a lot of information there. Um, locally, KUA is a network of uh, local community groups that's been working together. They're a great resource. Hawaii Community Foundation has stuff. There's all kinds of, of, of great things um, at the state website. I think. Um, it really depends on, on how people want to direct their actions, whether they want to get actively involved, whether they want to be involved in individuals. If you go to the NOAA website, there's all kinds of things about, you know, how to leave a lighter footprint um, as an individual. I think that's the, the thing that we can do most easily, just on a daily basis, think about what we're doing, um, what we're consuming, what we're creating. Um, and then uh, the more people want to get involved from that, there's all kinds of resources. I'm, I'm happy to provide some stuff if people have specific questions, but there's there's no shortage of advice out there, both locally and fully. Great. Thank you. Um, so I do want to give a big mahalo to both of you, Dr. Friedlander and, and to Lauren for being our guest presenters for today. I want to thank everybody that joined us on Zoom. Uh, thank the Hi-Fi staff behind the scenes helping this webinar run smoothly. Um, please save the date for our next public health action webinar, which will be on Wednesday, May 5th, and we will be sharing details and registration uh, links soon. Uh, be safe, be well, and we hope to see you on a future webinar. Aloha.